Uh, so over the centuries, it was realized by a lot of Muslims who were copying the text that if you relied on a non um, a non dotted or a partially dotted text, people are going to recite that differently. And that was what happened uh, by the time you get to Ibn Mujahid. So as I mentioned, Ibn Mujahid took seven of the most popular kiraat of his time and said these are the canonical ones. Now, it wasn't always the case that people said, oh, there are more than one valid um, ways of reading the text. So before Ibn Mujahid, there were many Muslims who were saying that, well, the reason why these variants exist is because of human error. So Shadi Hikmat Nasser, whom I mentioned earlier, has this to say in his book on the transmission of variant readings. Early Muslim scholars did not look at the variant readings of the Quran as divine revelation. They attributed the Quranic variants to human origins, either to the reader's ijtihad in interpreting the consonantal outline of the Quran, or simply to an error in transmission. This position changed drastically in the later periods, especially after the 5th or 11th century, where the canonical readings start to be treated as divine revelation, i.e. every single variant in the seven and ten eponymous readings was revealed by God to Muhammad. Now, I want to show you guys uh, examples of consonantal variants. I've been talking about consonantal variants earlier, but I haven't yet actually shown you guys any examples of it. So some of these uh, are actually post Ibn Mujahid. So uh, contrary to what some people might uh, say, the canonization of the seven did not eliminate uh, these variants. Rather, what happened to these variants is they got assigned a category known as anomalous or shad. And Shadi Hikmat Nasser in his book actually has uh, many examples of it that he records. So let me start by showing you a few of the more notable examples that Nasser points to. So the first one, in Surah 89, Ayah 18, in the Uthmanic text, uh, uh, as recorded in the 1924 Cairo edition, edition it says this, feed the poor. Yeah, so there is an anomalous variant here where an extra tat is added to the word tahadun. So that um, would be, you see the, the line with the two dots on top of it, as the letter ta, it makes the T sound. Um, so the one with the extra ta would yield the verb tatahadun. Uh, for those who do not know Arabic grammar, this is a difference in what you call the verbal form or the wazin. Uh, so one of the features of Arabic grammar is that uh, to form a word, a verb in particular, uh, you have to basically take the root, which is the three letters, and then you um, put them into a certain form or a stem. That is the wazin. And depending on what wazin the verb takes, it may slightly alter uh, the meaning of the verb. So uh, the extra tat there would... Hmm. My, let me see, I'm trying to figure out how that would change the meaning. Uh, it'll be a very subtle one. I don't think it would even be translatable, uh, but it does change what the wasn of the verb is. And it definitely changes the orthography of the manuscript because uh, the an extra a line would be added to the word, which would be visible even if you did not have diacritics. Now, let's go to another example, which would be highly visible even without diacritics. In Surah 86, verse 6, uh, it says, Khulika min ma in dafiq. So, dafiq is the word for spurting. So, in English, we would translate this as, He was created from spurting water. Dafiq is what you call a fa'il or an active participle form uh, from the verb dafaqa. Now, there was one variant reading where instead of an active participle, it would be a passive participle, uh, it would be madfuq. So it would be the difference between spurting water or spurted water. Obviously, that's a very, um, you know, fine shade of meaning, uh, which wouldn't necessarily impact 
uh, the text in a major way, except that um, there is a clear difference in the orthography here. And I don't think you can chalk this up to a mere difference in oral recitation because defek and madfuk sound very different in the way they are um, recited. Uh, so this is what you call a derivative variant. So the same verbal root is used, but they have a different derived form. So it's the difference between a passive and an active participle. Now, another one in Surah 88, uh, Ayah 2, uh, it says, Lasta alayhim bi musaitir. Now, this one is very interesting to me because according to Nasser, uh, the letter Saad uh, in musaitir is sometimes replaced with either a seen or a zayin. So for those who don't know Arabic, let me show you the difference. It's the difference between musaitir, musaitir, and muzaitir. Now, just hearing me say that, you can see that they're not exactly identical, but they're very similar to each other. Similar enough that if you were hearing someone recite it orally, you could see how someone could mishear one letter for the other and write it accordingly. But this would tell me that this particular variant is the result of someone hearing a text recited orally and copying down what he heard because there's no way you would have gotten this kind of variant from looking at the consonantal text. Uh, the letters Saad, Zayin, and Sin look very different from each other even without the diacritics. So far, so good. I have a couple of other interesting uh, variants to show. This one is also the product of oral um, recitation. So in Surah 95, Ayah 5, it says, Thumma radadnahu asfala safilin. Then we will reduce him to the lowest of the low. Now there is one anomalous variant that Nasser records where the word safilin has the definite article al in it. Now, one of the things that uh, maybe not everyone necessarily knows is that the definite article al, sometimes the l sound in it becomes assimilated to the letter that comes right above it or right after it. So you wouldn't say al safilin, but you say as safilin. Um, so the l sound disappears and the s sound from the scene um, becomes more pronounced. Now, if you were to say with a definite article versus without the definite article, the difference would be so slight that it would be almost impossible to uh, recognize in a purely oral recitation. So it would be easy to see how a variation like this uh, could arise from someone listening to an oral recitation and copying down what he heard. Now, I have one more resum variant uh, to show you. Uh, this one is kind of interesting. So there's that famous verse in Surah Al-Ikhlas that says, Lem yalid wa lem yulid. He begets not, nor is he begotten. There's one anomalous variant that Nasser mentions where the two verbs are actually uh, switched places. So instead of lam yalid wa lam yulid, it says lam yulid wa lam yalid. He neither is begotten nor does he beget. So this is classified by Nasser as a transposition where two words are reversed in their usual order. So, you know, when I mention shav uh, variants or anomalous variants, these are the sort of variants that um, Nasser has in mind, which are different from the uh, canonical seven, but are nonetheless present in some of our extant manuscripts. So um, Frederick Lemwis in Readings of the Quran, in the Encyclopedia of the Quran, uh, talks about the fact that a lot of these variant readings were well known to Muslim commentators. Um, a lot of tafasir uh, actually make mention of it. So it's not like Muslims are trying to hide this stuff for 
the better part of the classical period until fairly recent times. Yeah. This was actually well known among Muslim scholars. So it's yeah, you can here. even even if you even if you read some of the classical comment, like if you read Tafsir Jalalain, he's constantly yeah. pointing out, hey, there's another there's another reading of this yeah. verse. There's a different oh, some some read it according to this, you know, and and he'll put the textual mm -hmm. variants in the uh, in the text there, which which is you know part of what made it so odd. That you, yeah. their classical commentators are actually pointing out textual variants in different readings and so on, and then you got down to the more recent time, and it seems like the Dawa guys just just wanted the Quran to be different from the Bible. They wanted to be able to attack the Bible, but say that the Quran has something special about it. And so, I, I don't even know what to do other than just assume that there were it was a complete lie because anyone who knows about anything is going to be familiar. Like the point is, even if you just read the commentaries, you would be aware of textual variants, even if you never looked at manuscripts. So it's like, where does this come from? It just looks like a like a flat out lie. 